Hello everyone and um, welcome to the next talk in our Land of Shambhala Holistic Life series. Um, today's talk is Tibetan Medicine in Practice, uh, Self-Care and Practical ap Applications with Dr. Nashala G. Nienda. Um, if you've been listening to our other talks in the series, um, we have over 40 acres of land here in Victoria, Australia, um, to build Rinpoche's aspiration of a spiritual paradise where people can experience the life-changing qualities of the Colour Chakra Path. As part of Rinpoche's vision, we will bring together the teachings of Kala Chakra, the sciences and the various wisdom traditions all in one place. A major part of the Land of Shambhala vision is a healing garden of medicinal herbs um, that grew out of the aspiration to connect the people of Australia uh, with the world of Kala Chakra through the Bodhisattva sciences, including Kala Chakra and traditional medicines. Uh, Tibetan medicine may indeed derive from thousands of years of Tibetan and Buddhist traditions, yet its essence is timeless. Um, today we will learn what makes this unbroken Buddhist healing system work with grace, ease and power uh, to effect lasting change. Uh, before I introduce our guest speaker, I uh, firstly just wanted to uh, let people know that um, if there are any questions that you do have or want to ask throughout the talk, uh, please pop them in the Q&A section uh, in Zoom, or if you're joining us on Facebook, uh, in the Facebook chat. So today we are very fortunate to be joined by our mentor, a member, Doctor of Tibetan Medicine, Nashala G. Nienda as she shares techniques which demystify and bring forward um, the profound practices of Tibetan medicine. You'll only need to look in your kitchen cabinet, your garden and within to begin applying basic principles of Tibetan medicine into applicable and practical healing wisdom. To tell you a little bit more about our guest speaker, speaker uh, Dr. Nashala began to study Tibetan medicine in 1999 earning an interdisciplinary studies BA from Naropa University in 2001. At the urging of her root lama, Venerable Thagyu Rinpoche, she continued pursuing Tibetan medicine, medis, medical studies in India, eventually earning her Menpa degree, Doctor of Tibetan Medicine, conferred by the Qinghe, the Qinghe Tibetan Medicine College uh, in Tibet and the Shangshung Institute of Tibetan Medicine in 2009. Her Masters of Acupuncture in the Five Elements Lineage is from the Institute of the Taoist Education and Acupuncture. Nashala teaches worldwide and is an associate adjunct faculty at Naropa University. Founding the SOA Birthing Method for Women in the late stages of pregnancy and postpartum, she aims to prevent delivery complications and postpartum depression. Uh, Nashala is a clinical director at the Nienda Clinic of Tibetan Medicine and Holistic Healing in Boulder, Colorado, USA. So without further ado, here is Dr. Nashala. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And I just want to thank Rinpoche for allowing me to have this opportunity to share the preciousness of Tibetan medicine. Um, it's coming into more and more worldview. And when I first started to study there was like nothing in English and it's kind of becoming very popular, which makes me really happy. Um, and so it is my aspiration that I can share with you guys tonight some key points that you can take home and really help yourselves and your loved ones and benefit all sentient beings. So I'm gonna share my screen. I have a nice, um, program for you guys. So I have a lot of information and um, I'm going to have you just put questions in and I'm going to try and take questions at the end of the live feed. So Tibetan medicine, which is also known as the Soa Rigpa tradition, if you translate it back into Tibetan, and it is widely practiced throughout the trans Himalayan region, as far you know, west as Ladakh and as far east as Mongolia. And it is the primary medical treatment in the Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan. And it is widely used now in India 
and Nepal as well. So it has a lot of um, history and use, which I'm not going to get into, but we have to understand the source. It is very important to have a good connection to the lineage from where we are receiving something. And this is an unbroken lineage. And I'm sharing for you tonight from what's known as the Secret Oral Instructions Tantra on the Eight Branches of Nectar. So I could give a whole teaching on just the translation of this name, but I'm not going to because I want to give you some practical information. But I want you to know where this comes from. This is our text, and it is in, uh, the same text that has been unchanged since around the 8th century. So it's important that we understand that we are actually entering into a mandala here. We're entering a sacred mandala of Sangye Menla, the medicine Buddha, his pure land, which is known as an excellent abode. And Tibetan medicine is really understanding the sacredness of the interdependent nature of all phenomena that we are interacting with in our natural world. So it's said that there is no place upon this earth where you cannot find medicine. Even poison can be transmuted and turned into a, a dutsi or a nectar. So when we're receiving these teachings, understand that you're not receiving them from me. You're receiving them from my teacher and my teacher's teacher and my teacher's teacher. So what we're doing is we're entering the sacred mandala of the medicine Buddha and his pure land, which is known as Tanaduk. And I'm gonna briefly explain the four directions and the four mountains. So the first is um, known as this piercing one and it has the power of the South. And so it's the sun just sort of raging and piercing down upon um, this area within the mandala. And in this medicinal forest, there are these warming plants with uh, the qualities of heat and hot, sour and salty. They have very sharp powers and this allows it to cut through any like heavy cold disorders. And you see things such as uh, pippling, which is Piper longium up here in the right-hand corner, and I'm going to teach you about that later on this evening. So you also see like Tsitika, which is also here. And then one of my favorite medicines on the whole planet is our beautiful Sindhu, known as pomegranate. And pomegranate has a very special power. It has this power of sour, and so sour increases heat, particularly it increases our digestive powers. In my system, you always begin with digestion because you're feeding the whole system. We have something known as the seven bodily sustainers, which really nourish us all the way down through all of our tissues into our indestructible and destructible tigli, which lives in our heart. And so you can actually lengthen the, uh, the span of your lifetime by actually paying close attention to your digestion. It's kind of a cheat, really. You can become very enlightened only if you are in good health, right? So pomegranate, super simple. It has this power to help blaze the digestive heat, bring on the power of warmth, so it's not so good for people who are going to have acid reflux, for example, unless it's from cold nature disorders. However, there's a quality of pomegranate where we say when phlegm is misting the heart, meaning that if you have this feeling of heaviness, lethargy, when you eat food and you just feel like, you know, it's you want to take a nap, your mind is not clear. It's the after lunch kind of blah. If you take a spoonful of pomegranate concentrate or powdered pomegranate into hot water, it helps clear off that mist and that heavy earth and water phlegmy feeling from the heart. Now, remember that your mind is in your heart in this system. So it clears the mind, clears the heart. It's very good for awakening the senses. So here in the South, of this mandala, we find all of these magical herbs, which have the power to really eliminate disorders of cold. 
In the north, we have the snow clad mountain. And of course, it's in the north and it's snowy. So there you find all of the bitter, the sweet, the astringent kind of medicines and foods and substances, which those all have qualities of being very blunt and dull and cooling. So it's, again, it's the opposite of the South. The South was very sharp and kind of sour and heat raising. Here, we're just kind of dimming down that heat. We're just putting the lid on it. We are essentially inviting the cool. So it eliminates disorders of heat. And so you see substances growing there such as sandalwood, camphor, eaglewood, which is a very famous medicine in Tibetan medicine. People use it a lot for wind disorders as well. And nimpa or neem, which you might have heard from Ayurveda. So it's said that these medicines are especially fragrant. And that is because disorders of tipa, which is related to heat or bile, is going to really respond well to this fragrant, sort of beautiful appearance medicine. And so it's said that wherever their scents pervade, you cannot have a heat disorder arise. And then we have the beautiful Terminella forest. So here in the east, you find all of the different types of Terminella. So you might have heard of Aru, Baru, and Kiru. So this is the Drebusum. Dre means result or fruit. So Drebu means fruit and Sum means three. So Drebu has a dual meaning that it can also mean the res like the result of like one's karma, or it can mean like a combination. But here we're referring to these three sacred fruits, but there are multiple different types of Arura. There's like many, many different types. So here in the, in the east of the Medicine Buddha's lands, we see that these root of these plants which grow here specifically will cure disorders of the bones. The trunks will cure disorders of the muscle. The branches will cure disorders of the blood vessels, the nerves, and the ligaments. The bark, of course, the skin. The leaves for the vessel organs. The flowers for our sense organs. And the fruits are for our side, uh, solid vital organs and the heart. So if you are familiar with Chinese medicine, this would be the yin organs, right? So we have this forest full of medicine and full of this special three fruit cocktail, which I will talk about at the end. And then we have in the West, here we have a variety of very important medicines, which I'm going to talk about a little later. Especially we have what's known as the Zangpo Druk. So this means the six excellences or the six good medicines. So we have nutmeg, we have bamboo pith, saffron, black cardamom, also known as greater cardamom, green cardamom, and clove. We find the five types of calcite. Calcite is one of the most important medicines for really serious digestive issues. I call it the Tibetan Prilosec because it can cure chronic ulcers inside the stomach and the duodenum. And you also find five different types of mineral pitch, which we call um, shilajit, commonly within India, we call it drakshun in Tibetan. So there are different types and it has characteristics upon where it's found in the mountains. So it might be accompanying gold or silver, copper, iron, or lead. And so of course it has to go through a, a purification process just like calcite does. And then we also have the five types of hot springs. So where I live, we have hot springs. So my patients will definitely get prescriptions for, I want you to go to this hot springs because it has more sulfur. I want you to go to this hot springs because it has more calcite. I want you to go to this one for the, the coal nature. So we have all of this in the West. So you can see by understanding this, that we have 
this miraculous kingdom within the medicine Buddha's realm right at our disposal. And then the other thing that I want to mention is that when you receive a teaching, of course, it's about the, the proper time. You have to have the proper audience and it's the proper or excellent teaching and the excellent teacher. So you are surrounded around the medicine Buddha as an excellent retinue from the most excellent teacher. So you're receiving these teachings from that who has gone beyond illness. He has moved beyond the attachment, the aggression, and the ignorance, which keeps us embodied in samsara to the point where we have covered up our own intrinsic basic Buddha nature. And so when we enter the mandala, we're receiving this from the excellent teacher. So basic theory on Tibetan medicine. We cannot go beyond Tibetan medicine without understanding that we got here, here in this temporary body that you exist in, by having our own karmic propensity propel us forward when we were unembodied into a co-mingling with all five elements. All five elements have to be together in order to obtain this precious human body. With that, how does pathophysiology begin? It begins with the root poison. Of course, all things begin with ignorance, not stupidity, but the forgetfulness of the interdependent nature of phenomena, of our precious natural world, and how we get too attached to the way that we think it should be, or we're very adverse to the way we think it shouldn't be, or we just pretend it's not happening at all. None of them are good, but they are our three root poisons. They combine with our five elements, and they form what's known as the nepasum. So this is the three faults. Sometimes you might hear this translated as humor. Um, I don't like that word because it's not really accurately portraying the connection to the imbalance of the three root poisons. When we're in a homeostasis state, which is constantly shifting, right? It's static. So we're constantly working with our own mind, with our own body in this encasing of a human bag of bones. And so when we go off balance, we're heading into a faulty state of balance or imbalance. So these have names. We call them lung, which is wind, tipa, which is heat or bile, sometimes fire. You can think of it that way. We have pagan which is earth and water. And then everyone says, well, what about space? Space is omnipresent. You have to have space in your vasculature in order to have your blood flow. You have to have space in your spongy bone. You have to have space in between all those dermal layers. And you have to have space in between your organs. So space is omnipresent and it's existing within everything. And these connect directly to the five Buddha families, but we don't have time to connect to that today. But there are specific characteristics where we can understand how the energy of lung or wind has a characteristic very much like a rice cake or a cracker. So it's coarse, it's light, it's cool, it's subtle, it's mobile, it flaps around, our mind flaps around. Heat is very sharp, it's hot, it's very light because it rises. It can also be very moist if you think about our sweating and malodorous and stinky, a little bit oily and purgative, right? Hot on the way in means hot on the way out. And then we have our combination of earth and water, which sometimes people translate pagan as phlegm. It's really not the best translation, but it does give an accurate uh, sort of viewpoint of what I say is like heavy cottage cheese, right? It's oily, it's cool, it's heavy, it's blunt, it's smooth, it's firm, meaning it doesn't go anywhere. It's very stable and it's sticky, right? And then of course the omnipresent space. So if you memorize these characteristics or these qualities, um, 
you can understand all of Tibetan medicine and you can naturally antidote yourself by seeing where your own form is in time, space, season, mind state. And then you can apply the correct antidote knowing that, okay, I have too much earth and water right now. I'm feeling very heavy. I'm very kind of dull. I'm kind of not really moving anywhere. So then you can go and you can get that pomegranate, which is sour and hot and sour is very sharp. And so we're going to cut through that earth and water. So you see, you have a lot of antidotes waiting for you if you just pay attention to natural phenomena. So the elements of the body I basically described, but earth provides the solid base. Water provides fluidity and moisture. Fire bestows heat and movement with the heat. And the air is empowered by the subtle natures to be mobile while space is offering potentiality. So possibility for development and change. Just briefly on these elements. So again, earth is the base. It allows stability to grow and flourish. It's responsible for our muscles, our bones, our sense of smell and our nose. Water is the lubricant which is required in the body. So this means bodily fluids, AKA endocrine hormones. So the pagan sort of fault or this particular humor is very much related to endocrine system disorders. So also this is important for the formation of having the right level of blood in the body. It also provides sense of taste and aids the throat. Fire provides our circulation, warmth, maturing, ripening. We are kind of in the earth and water stage in our early childhood development. We're pudgy, you know, we have rolls of fat. We're always got a runny nose. Kids are always just kind of little chunks and they can just, they fall asleep. You know, they don't, they can sleep through so many things usually, right? If they're healthy and balanced. And so then what happens is hormones start to kick in and we become teenagers and we start to kick on that fire. And then we grow and we develop sort of, you know, this desire to like be something. And that's kind of like moving us up. And this fire energy creates, you know, we're going to make a career, we're going to study, we're going to have relationships, we're going to have children. So this is a very maturing and ripening process that we're in sort of mid-teens, kind of through the end of our life. And this is responsible for a lot of our body temperature. We have something called the color complexion bile. And it also is connected to the eyes and our sense of sight. There is a direct correlation from the liver to the eyes, and this is found in multiple systems of medicine. So our air element assists in growth. So this helps to spread and harden. It helps things move from subtle um, and gross and back again. So this is very much dependent on how we circulate and run the information through what I call our central computer, the CNS, right? Central nervous system, brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nervous system. So this is everything from our hands, feet, and back up into the central computer. So how we live and exist within our nervous system has a lot to say with how we move and grow. And it's responsible for our breathing, for our speaking, for our skin and our sensation of touch. And there's a huge component with air where when we start to really work on our breath and breathing practices, we can actually change the whole dynamics of our nervous system. So namka or space is multidimensional meaning that it allows for possibility and growth to occur. If there was no space, nothing could grow. So this is responsible for our body cavities from the very smallest capillary in the lungs and the interstitial spaces and our hollow organs like our bladder, right? And so it also provides this sense of hearing. 
So I do see some of your questions and I'm going to get to them at the end. So how do we take this basic information that we are receiving in this mandala? How do we begin to understand how these elements regulate and interact with one another and our own personal propensities? So there's a few things that are vitally important. Pay attention to your root poison. Many people think that when they study Buddhism, they're going to suddenly be very nice and kind and happy. But instead, you have to be able to look at the neurosis in your mind. And that means you have to see how you have a habitual tendency of either ignorance breeding more ignorance, ignorance breeding hatred, or ignorance breeding grasping and attachment. It's not that one is better than the other and we all have them. So there's no judgment. That's just called human samsara. But if you pay attention to where that is, you can start to see how it appears in the body. So we pay attention to our habitual thinking and that leads us to understand how we're making habitual choices, which take us into the fault realm of imbalance, of non-homeostasis. And then we have to pay attention to the world we live in, which is something that we have as humans grown away from. And if you grew up like Rinpoche did out in the middle of a yak, you know, tent, you were very aware of what season it was and how it impacted your body. But here we are now in modern times trying to control everything. And that control itself is a form of attachment. And so we're out of balance with our natural cycle and how the season is influencing us because our bodies are gonna react very different from summer to winter. So I wanna explain a little bit more about how we move into pathophysiology. It is about knowing who you are. It is about knowing what you're constantly choosing in terms of your root poisons and habits and knowing how to antidote with those qualities that I described. So here they are again. And I'm just reminding you of this because it's really important to begin to understand how the quality of these three vital functions actually correspond directly with the qualities and the powers of effect within Tibetan medicine. So lung or wind tends to be more panic, anxiety, insomnia, nervous system disorders, very light sleeping, um, really unsettled, unstable mind. In Tibetan, we call this simchoa. And this means that we're not actually able to rest. I sometimes imagine this idea of teaching the wind to kind of put the concrete shoes on, or you imagine the moon disc upon which the Buddha will sit. You have to have some stability in the mind. Otherwise, the wind is just flapping everywhere. And that very much affects the nervous system, which is why shamatha practice and following your breath and learning how to deepen into resting in the nature of mind just by sitting and following your breath is one of the most profound practices you can do to heal disorders of lung. Tipa, or this fire or bile, very much related with blood, with heat. So eczema, psoriasis, chronic sinus infections, liver disorders, blood disorders, gout, acid reflux, this kind of heat-based indigestion, um, really any kind of itis. If there's an itis, there's inflammation. Inflammation means heat. So it's relating to those qualities. Sometimes I describe it as like a hot curry, right? There's that sharp, right? Light, purgative, moist, oily quality. And so you need to really understand how to cool down so the seat for fire or bile is actually in your torso. We have pagan in our head, earth and water. Our torso is mostly related with fire. 
And so when fire rises, we get a sharp headache, right? And oh, it's right behind the eyes. And it's like somebody's just stabbing you, right? If the headache roams all over, and sometimes it's here and sometimes it's there, that's an influence of wind. But if the headache is dull and heavy and constant and the same for two days in a row and not quite as bad, it might be more related with this pagan or this earth and water. So these qualities of these functions um, for pagan tends to be more endocrine system. Like I mentioned, it relates with... Um, all of the joints and the fluids in between the joints. So arthritis is like a, we actually have multiple types of arthritis, but the most common form of you feel it's going to rain and your knee hurts. Yeah, that's more earth and water. Okay, that's not like an inflammatory arthritis, which is TIPA and fire. And it's not like an arthritis that like moves from your hip one day to your knee the next day and your shoulder the next day and that's wind. So by understanding who you are in this moment in space, in this moment of time, in the season that you live in, with the influence of the environment around you, has a lot to say with how you would then antidote using those qualities and characteristics. So the root tantra really explains it all. There are four methods of treatment in our system. And this is called Sojetap. And we, this is the percentages are totally mine. This is not traditional. This is something that I say. So just know that. Um, and this is comes from 20 years of clinical practice. If the doctor knows what they're doing, they can explain who you are and how you exist in the world by reading the pulse, the urine, speaking with you and getting a, a read of the energetics of your body. And so they basically become the guide. It's like saying, this is your suitcase. This is what you need to pack in summer. This is what you need to pack in winter. So if I've done my job, I've explained the qualities and characteristics of food and behavior well enough that it kind of becomes the biggest category of treatment because you eat every day. So food is medicine has been said for centuries. And it's true because a lot of the foods that I'm going to explain to you later on in this talk of that have medicinal qualities, they're all things you can access in your kitchen cabinet and your spice cabinet. Behavior falls into several categories, right? So that could be spiritual behavior, it can be sleep hygiene, it can be how much you exercise or how little you exercise. And then we may need to add in the other aspects of the stool. So we might need to add in some accessory therapy, which would be like some kunye massage, or maybe we do some compresses, or maybe we do some um, needling, or maybe we do some mayboom, which is cupping, um, or, you know, we might do a vapor bath or hot springs therapy, for example. So accessory therapy is a wide possibility of treatment options as well. And then we have our medicine. So the medicinal formulas are another leg of the stool. Really, it's my hope always to get people off medicine and to be more relating to diet and behavior. So that's very important. When you are a doctor, you have to understand that every substance on the earth is a medicine, just like Medicine Buddha's mandala, which offers everything we need. If again, I'm reminding you, memorize these characteristics of these three faults of lung, tipa, pagan, wind, bile, and earth and water. If you do that, you can understand something known as lay. Lay here means action. So this, in the medical context, it's slightly different than you would understand in the other Tibetan word context. But here, what it means, it's removing the diseases of these nepa. It's removing the diseases of these three humors. And it does so by antidoting through the quality or the yunten. So we look at the taste because the taste is going to have a quality and we look at the quality 
and the yunten meaning the characteristics or what they have to offer. So this leads us back to what we've been saying the whole time, that this is about reliance and interdependence. So understanding the natural world that you're living in, knowing that in the medical text, it says the taste, which is upon the tongue is the true taste, trusting in your senses, trusting an understanding of the reaction that a, a taste brings. So the sweet taste, for example, has a cold energy. Why? Because it is formed from the elements of earth and water. Therefore, it aggravates earth and water. However, it will pacify disorders of wind and tipa or bile. Why would that be, right? Why would it be that it could aggravate phlegm or earth and water? Because it's heavy, because it matches the characteristics of earth and water, right? So you're adding more, it's just going to bother more. And likewise, we understand that the wind is very light, fire is very light. What do you give? What, what do you get when you add earth and water to something that's very light and fiery and airy? You bring it down, right? So you're putting on the saddlebags, you're kind of adding sand onto the bags of the hot air balloon, bringing it down. So we look at these six tastes, and I'm not going to get into each of them because they're a complete teaching in and of themselves, but you can go back and review this later, or you can go to my website. I have lots of information on there as well, and lots of publications that talk about this. Um, but we understand basically that we have what's known as the six tastes. Those six tastes match and interact with the inner elements inside the body of those nesum, of those three humors. Simply meaning, we're taking something from the outside, we're putting it inside, they're having a conversation, and then they turn into something else. So the sweet taste remains sweet post-digestively, right? And we've got the sour taste and the salty taste and the bitter and the hot and the astringent. So those are very advanced teachings that I basically said, medically speaking, but it's just really important to strip it down to understand that these characteristics are based on the elements. And so everything you taste becomes a treatment potentially, because you begin to understand the energy of what you're eating. You're understanding the elements of what you're eating. So oftentimes people will be like, why do you hate potatoes so much? And I'm like, why does everyone have such bad indigestion? Potatoes are grown in the earth. They're underneath the dirt. They're heavy. They're dense, right? So if you have a cold natured indigestion, potatoes is going to harm you because you're just basically taking the power of earth and water and dumping it on top a disorder of earth and water. So hopefully that makes sense. I'll check at the end with the questions. But we also have to understand our seasonal influence. So where I am in the US is opposite to you all in Australia. And so right now spring is emerging. So what's happened is we've had this cold accumulation of earth and water or this pagan nature that has accumulated over time throughout winter. And so it's just gotten heavier and heavier and heavier, and then it starts to rise up. And then what happens is the spring warmth comes and starts to melt it. Think about this. Think about if you were um, looking at a frozen river and then spring came, what's it going to do? It's going to melt. And that melting process is part of the pacification process. And if you pay attention to it and ride the influence of that seasonal pacification, say you have an earth and water disharmony, spring is going to be a dangerous time for you. It's going to be more likely that you might get colds, flus, COVID, you know, whatever, because you're going to have an excess of earth and water, which is going to slow down the endocrine system, 
It's going to slow down your immune system. And so all of that melting process, you get more phlegmy, right? And then a cold wind comes on your neck and you get a cold. So you can pacify easier by applying the principles of how do we antidote that heavy earth and water, right? We want the qualities of sour, pomegranate. We want the warmth. We want to have something light, not heavy and sticky and stable. We want to have cooked foods. Let's not have raw smoothies in the spring. Not a good idea to cleanse with raw food in the spring, right? And so you have to apply this understanding to whichever you know, season you live in in the world. If it's flipped and opposite, depending on the hemisphere, then you pay attention to that. Okay, but this is coming from thousands of years of tradition from the rooftop of the world. So you just have to reapply it to your own place and time. So we have very specific diet and behavior for um, Lung, Tipa, and Pagan. They have very specific aspects of them that you can find in the 13th, 14th, and the 15th chapters of the Shagir, which is the explanatory or second Tantra. These teachings are available in English. You can go onto the Minsi Kong uh, website and order the whole Tantra and um, read it and give you some information on those dietetic chapters. I also want to talk about behavior. So individual behavior, daily habits are listed. Then we have spiritual behavior. We have seasonal lifestyle behaviors relating to understanding that accumulation, the arisal, and the pacification. And then we have sort of momentary or like natural urges or circumstantial, it's sometimes called behavior. So this is where we say, you know, don't hold the fart in, right? Literally, it says that do not hold the fart in. That's where the bad thoughts come from. It will disturb the mind. It literally talks about that. Don't suppress your vomit. Don't suppress your sneezes. You know, things like that. Like don't hold your urine too long. All of those kind of like sort of natural urges should be paid attention to. So what does it say in the tantras for lung or wind? It says literally, and I translate, you should stay in a warm, dark, room with a good friend or lover to speak sweetly to you. That's literally what it says. It means that you need to learn how to detach from that root poison that causes lung to overdevelop itself. And you need to maintain a more stress-free, relaxed atmosphere. You need to engage in people who don't stir you up, right? You need the dimness because lung is really overstimulated, too much talking, too much mantra of resuscitation, too much visualization, too much studying, too much working, you know, too much engagement of the sensory uh, organs, then this can actually impact the wind in a negative way. And so you want to maintain a sort of stress-free, relaxed atmosphere. If you look at it from the point of view of meditation, this is why after we do generation and completion stage meditation, we rest. We just rest in the nature of what is, or the mind, or Dzogchen, depending on how you're practicing, right? You just rest. So you're allowing your, your wind to, again, settle, and that's because you're minimizing that kind of intense pressure. What it says for the behavior of tipa, or for bile, is that you should stay near a cool river, a stream or a body of water and stay in cool areas. Also says that you should inhale sweet fragrances. If you remember the, the mandala where we had the myrrh and not, excuse me, the myrrh, but the sandalwood and we had the neem and we had these fragrant, you know, garland medicines there to antidote heat disorders. So, you know, you're wanting to smell that because again, a lot of them are very sweet and sweet again is going to decrease TIPA. So also the type A person who really wants to be a good meditator is not really gonna work through their TIPA nature very easily if they're trying to fight themselves to get free, 
right? So they need to relax and learn how to integrate letting go of that kind of aggressive nature and promote a state of mindfulness. And one of the best antidotes actually in practice for TIPA is actually metta or loving kindness. So the behavioral antidote for pagan says that if you are a bump on a log and you don't move a lot and you don't exercise a lot, exercise and movement of the body is going to help to move that heavy earth and water. It's going to help your endocrine system. It's going to move your blood. We know from a Western perspective that cardiovascular exercise has a direct impact on the endocrine system. We know that. And Tibetan medicine knew that thousands of years ago. Okay. Same thing. You want to have that sunlight and that warmth. So this type of person could do a hot yoga, whereas the tipa natured person needs to do a yin yoga and a slow yoga in a cool room. Okay. Very different. And the lung natured person probably should not be trying to do prostrations at light break speed. They should do slow prostrations, slow mantra. And the example I give is when you're doing mantra resuscitation and you're saying, oh, money, bend me, 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 oh, you're stimulating lung. So you're also kind of moving the fire a little bit as well. And so for both lung and fire, based kind of people, you need to really slow that down. Whereas the earth and water, the heavy nature of pagan, that's going to really be sharp. So that's a good antidote, right? But feel the difference between, oh, money, head me. Oh. It's true. It's going to take you longer to get through your nundro. It's going to take you longer to get through your practice. But what's the benefit? The benefit is that your mind will be settled. So it's far better to do practice with a settled mind and a concentrated mind that can really ponder samsara and ponder the nature of interdependent phenomena by really slowing it down and allowing that space or that moon disk to appear in our subtle body, that stability. So behavior really much relates to sensory um, interaction as well. So now we're to everybody's favorite which is the third trunk of healing, and this is medicine. So on the allegory tree, again, I introduced this concept of the six tastes. There are three post-digestive tastes. And then we have something called nupa. Nupa is different from qualities, although sometimes in English translations, you'll see it relating to this idea of qualities. I think of qualities and characteristics as saini, as the Tibetan word saini, which means, you know, those characteristics of the napasum. So remember the, the rice cake or the chip of lung, the hot curry for bile, and the heavy cottage cheese or the potato chip, like the giant, you know, baked potato, mashed potato for earth and water. So when we're understanding nupa, Nupa is a very complex sort of advanced understanding of Tibetan pharmacology, but it means that you have the ability to have something interact with something else and have an effect upon that. Meaning that if I'm holding this pin here and this pin comes and it pushes, that Nupa has changed it somehow which an antidoting quality or tseni or characteristic does have a reaction and interaction, but nupa is a very sort of special power. Um, it's, a it's hard to translate. It's a very special power. 
And we have to understand that certain medicines have a very special power. So that's kind of the best I can give in this sort of brief introduction. But we also within the tantras have very different types of medicines. So we have soup medicines, chang medicines, so medicinal alcohols. And you could classify the modern day tincture under this category, although it is not traditional to our system. We do have very specific recipes for medicinal alcohols. Um, Butters, medicine butters. If you want to read about those, you can um, go to my academia page and read an article I wrote about those. Emetics, sometimes we need to purge the system. So there are Zhongjie medicines. There are medicines which either purge up or down, depending on which elements we're trying to influence. So you don't have to look very far to actually find medicine, because again, it exists everywhere on this earth. But there are a few key things that you need to pay attention to. The first and most important is, is it hot or is it cold? So I told you I would explain the six goods. So Zangpo Druk. Zangpo Druk are the six excellent medicines. You will almost always find these on the shrine of a mempa or a doctor. Um, these are very special medicines that have special powers within our pharmacopoeia. The first is zati or nutmeg, and it is particularly good for the heart and the soxin, so the life-sustaining channel and the life-sustaining wind. A little bit of nutmeg in your um, sort of make a chai really, with like black cardamom, green cardamom, cloves, nutmeg, cinnamon, and a little bit of ginger. Boil it up, add just a little bit of milk. If you can do milk, you can also do like an oat milk, you can do an almond milk. It doesn't have to be like a cow milk. And then a little bit of honey. And this is a natural wind nightcap that you can have in the evening to kind of cool down the mind and the nervous system and really stimulate the warmth and circulation so that you can settle into the evening energy and not become too amped. So nutmeg is a prized medicine for the heart and for when wind improperly enters into the heart. So um, the bamboo pith is for the lungs and this is particularly good for like post COVID syndrome. Um, eating bamboo shoots is really healthy. Saffron is mostly for the liver and the blood. You can over coagulate. If you have a clotting disorder or a history of blood clots, you don't wanna do a lot of saffron. But if you have a bleeding disorder, frequent bloody noses, these kinds of things, you wanna do some saffron. And um, the, uh, greater saffron uh, is the really very tightly one from um, Pakistan, mostly. So we call it Kaji Gurgum, which means that it's um, from the Muslim areas. And that's different from safflower, which has a similar power, but not quite as strong. Black cardamom is especially good for spleen. Spleen, of course, is a giant lymph organ. And sometimes wind can enter the spleen. And so black cardamom is especially good for spleen disorders or when liver and spleen are kind of attacking each other. Green cardamom is one of the best medicines for the kidneys. And it's going to be as popular as turmeric once people catch on to that. It can actually dissolve kidney stones. It is very good for increasing circulation for a woman who wants to get pregnant, a woman who has difficulty maintaining a pregnancy throughout the pregnancy. It helps the blood circulate around the womb. And then cloves is especially good for the life force channel, for the lungs and the aorta. So post COVID, during COVID even, I would have a lot of people do single clove tea. So I don't know how we're doing on time and I can't actually see these chats. We, we are good. So um, yeah, feel free to continue. We've got okay. another half an hour, which okay. includes the Q&A too. So go for it. So chives is a really common food. 
according to our crystal mala, um, it's compounding medicine is really good for drying up a lot of pus and plasma. It's really get good against like parasites. Um, it can help relieve swelling. Um, it's very good for when wind is attacking the stomach. We call this uh, polung and liver, kidney. It's used when there's a lot of cold deep in the kidneys. Cold can drop down into the lower parts of the body because what does earth and water do? It falls. And so this can also be very helpful for um, too many nocturnal emissions in men or also too much um, yeast infections in women. So it can be very good. It has a lot of potassium and iron. Um, it is really quite well documented um, as an active compound for lowering cholesterol and blood pressure. However, in our system of Soa Rigpa, we would warn against that if that is due to heat natured, and that's because this is hot. So cumin is a totally misunderstood, underutilized medicine of great magnitude. This, if you have eaten something that is just not sitting right in your stomach, you just take a pinch of the cumin, put it into like a cup about this size, and you just boil it up and you drink it. It's going to get rid of gas, gas pains, bloat, indigestion. It helps relieve that kind of um, heavy feeling. It opens the appetite. And so it's used also a lot for lung or wind conditions that are affecting the emotions and our mental states. And this is due to the fact that it is a very hot taste, but it also has a lot of sweet in it. So that sweet really calms down the wind. And so I often will tell patients all the time, you know, who are complaining of indigestion that a little bit of cumin may be added with ginger if you're cold natured after um, your meal can be a great thing. It also is well documented to stimulate our T cells. So this is the CD4 and the CD8 and the TH1 cytokine expression. So there's a lot I could say about that, but we don't have a lot of time. So it's very good to use because we're coming out of the pandemic, but the pandemic is still around us. So um, the other thing I really love about this spice is that it's an excellent source of iron. So if you're a vegetarian, put this in your food because it's going to actually really benefit you by providing you some iron. Um, I think it's like something like a hundred grams contains like 66 milligrams of iron, which is like crazy amount. So it's really easy to add this to your diet if you're a vegetarian and it's gonna help you digest well and it's gonna provide a good source of iron. So coriander <clears throat> is another great um, underutilized sort of spice. And, you know, depending on the commentary, you can see different kind of results of whether some say it's warm, some say it's cool. It kind of depends. So I've kind of listed the different commentaries that say what it is or how it works. Um, but what I will say from my experience of it is that it is a little bit cool and it does have a little bit of an oily quality to it um, and perhaps just like a little bit of sweet. So in traditional herbalism in the West, in America, this is used as like an analgesic, antispasmodic, um, sort of digestive karmative, meaning just like the cumin, it can sort of help calm down digestion. And because it does have a little bit of sweet to it, I think it can be very helpful in cases of tipa or bile. Um, you don't wanna do too much, but a little bit is fine. And so this is also a great culinary spice that can be used. Fennel is so wonderful for people that are suffering from heat disorders. And it is also magnificent for people who have a lot of common allergies. Um, and because it really helps with our histidine levels. And this is a great uh, herb that you can use as an eye wash for like inflamed eyes. You mix it with fenugreek seed, which is very bitter and cooling, and you mix it with a little bit of fennel. 
and you boil that up and then you can wash the eyes with it if it's very hot or you can add rose petals, which are very cooling and you can wash the eyes with it. If you have an eye infection, you can get some barberry bark or some um, Oregon grape root or anything within the barberry family and you can boil that up and add it to the fennel and it's a really wonderful eye wash. So it also is known to strengthen those seven bodily sustainers really help with the gas pain. So this is, if you have the more hot indigestion, I might recommend fennel because it does really help with that. It's known for really fighting against uh, bacterial infections inside the digestive tract. And it's also very good for hiccups. So fenugreek, I just spoke about. I love fenugreek in the summer. Now it is a mild diuretic. It is famous in the West, of course, for producing breast milk, but this is really wonderful in my experience that it does not harm like sort of TIPA. I mean, it really lowers TIPA despite this um, sort of um, qualities that it has being very mucousy. It is a mucinologic herb, so it will kind of wholly coat the whole alimentary canal with a little bit of ease. So for that reason, it can be really helpful in eliminating gas and diarrhea, improving circulation. Um, you can actually use it on burns on your skin. You can make a compress or like a paste, and it's very easy to use. You do want to stop drinking it by about 3 p.m. Otherwise, you're going to be peeing all night and you will remember me and not be happy. <laughs> Saffron, again, I've already discussed its wonderful nature for the liver and for the eyes, of course, because they're connected. So stagnancy of blood, any bile natured condition, any liver condition, any blood condition, any sort of condition where there has anything to do with any kind of inflammation or bleeding, um, this is very helpful. So for example, if women are having really difficult, heavy periods, I might have them take three or four threads of saffron, soak them in water overnight, and drink them for the first three days of their menses, and it can help lighten that period as we're trying to clean their system. It is known as what's called a menta in Tibetan. So men means medicine. Ta is horse, so it carries the medicine deeper into the body. So you can also make saffron water and take it with some medicine that is for heat, and it's going to make that medicine stronger. It's going to carry it like a horse deep to the liver and be like, here you go. Word of caution, if you have an enlarged prostate or, again, you have a clotting disorder, you don't want to take too much of this. Ginger, I talked a little bit about before. Of course, it's used a lot in the West for nausea and pregnancy. However, it is very hot. It kind of really helps open up the appetite and make food digestible. Um, and it really can eliminate some excess cold cholesterol and blood thickening due to poor circulation. Um, but you wanna use it cautionary if you have too much heat. Long pepper is um, one of my favorite um, peppers that there is. <clears throat> it has a lot of isolated um, constituents which make it really wonderful, but it's one of the components in a formula called the three hots and it's praised both as a medicine and as a spice. What makes it so special is that it's a little bit oily and it's a little bit sweet. And so that really makes it a prime candidate with its warmth, it's oily and it's sweet to really help wind, but it doesn't really harm the pagan or the earth and water because it does have that heat. So when you have dual combinations of peilung, which is wind plus the earth and water, this is one of the best spices to use. It really helps um, work with um, in increasing circulation throughout the whole body. It is definitely a rejuvenative medicine um, and it helps aid in our absorption. It's really good to use when people 
are healing from chronic indigestion where they've had a lot of mucus on their stools and really will strengthen the seven bodily sustainers. So turmeric, of course, everybody knows turmeric, but did you know that you have to combine turmeric with black pepper in order to make it anti-inflammatory? It won't work otherwise. What we really use it for in Tibetan medicine is to be an anti-poison medicine. So um, it's very good for eye infections. It's very good for IBS. It's very good for um, poisons, parasites. Um, it's got a lot of research that shows that it's very good against um, lupus, which is an autoimmune disease, and Crohn's, which is an autoimmune disease, and IBS, which is an autoimmune disease. So you see where I'm going here. It's very good for the immune system. So um, <clears throat> people who have suffered from H. pylori infections for a long time, this can be very helpful. Um, so it is very you know, famous as an anti-inflammatory, but it has a lot of other things that it will do too. The one thing I want to caution in is that you don't want to use too much if you have any kind of history of jaundice. If you've had hepatitis, um, it may not be the best for you. So I promised to talk about the three fruits, the aru, the baru, and the kuru. I do want to caution you that the aru seed pit is poisonous. Do not consume it if you decide that you want to dabble with Tibetan medicine. This is known as the drebu sum or the three fruit decoction. We use this to divide good blood and bad blood before we bleed things. So if I'm treating someone's gout, for example, and I'm going to drain um, a point on their big toe, I would give this to them for three to five days before I would do that procedure um, to make sure that I divide the good and the bad blood. This is sometimes um, a little bit mildly um, laxative in its effect. So people who might need a little bit of help with that, this is a very safe way to do so while also um, really detoxifying the blood. You will look inside formulas and you will find these three fruits in multiple formulas. So um, you can commonly get it by looking up trifla, which is what it's called in Ayurveda. So I wanted to give you a recipe that would be really good for strengthening your body, rich in minerals and calcium, so good for your bones, really good for postmenopausal women, it's good for the skin. So that would be nettles, which is what Milarepa ate, right? Very rich in minerals. I could go on for days by how wonderful nettles is. Alfalfa is very rich in um, minerals and calcium and oat straw or wild milky oats as well. So if you have conditions of lung, it's more likely that you're going to have like osteopenia, for example, or osteoporosis. So this is a great decoction. So you see that photo there where you see the herbs are floating to the top. So I'm, I'm doing a huge concentration of this and then you pour in boiling water and you let it sit overnight. And then you can strain that and drink it throughout the next day or next few days. You can also do something where <clears throat> you add what's known as a katsar on top, which means an addition. So then you can add to that things like skull cap for the nervous system, passion flower for the rumigating gerbil wheel mind, hibiscus flowers if there's a little bit of heat, cardamom, if there's a little bit of kidney coldness, nutmeg, if you have some panic and insomnia. So you get where I'm going with this. You just add on top of this and then that becomes like a good tonic. So what I want to say to you is you should know yourself, know thyself, right? Know thy measure. Be aware of your limitations. Know what you're capable of doing and what you're not capable of doing. And even though this was attributed to Socrates, it was a common idiom. So I have these examples, right, of lung or attachment really blowing us away, aggression really burning us up. And I love this one for ignorance where people are just watching a volcano come towards them. 
or like the iceberg that we think is just this tiny little thing and we're ignoring it, but it's really this giant thing underneath that we need to be addressing. So if you know yourself, then it's um, it's much better to, it's a much better way to sort of help yourself. So let's see, I've stopped. This, have I stopped the screen sharing properly here? We can still see it. How do I, how do I do that? Stop share. There we go. There you go. Beautiful. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Nishala. That was fantastic and lots and lots of information for people too and practical applications. So thank you very much. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, I'm not, uh, do you have, a, I guess, a, a slide where you want to share your contact details or best website? Um, is it your holistic health or? It is. The, I can um, share my beginning slide, which has my website. Perfect. I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, for everyone. Um, but it is holistic-health.org. Um, so you can find out um, about um, and contact Dr. Nashala from there as well. It's that one. Yep. Perfect. Uh, lovely. You can also find me on, um, <clears throat> you can also find me on Facebook. I do put up a lot of um, sort of, articles on our Tibetan medicine page, but I also have a page as well. And then you can Google me and you can find me on Academia. And so you can read a lot of the things I put out, I put out for free. So you can um, read those there. Um, okay. Perfect. Um, and if anyone has any other questions, please do pop them in the Q&A section. Um, so so I'm looking at a couple of them. I'm gonna stop and share for a second. Um, wait, did I do this right? <laughs> I'm always lost at the stop part. No, you're right. You're right. We can see you. Okay, good. Um, I just can't see you now. <laughs> um, so essentially somebody asked, uh, how to heal retinal detachment and poor retina of the eyes. So, um, retinal detachment, it is very important to actually lay down face down and allow that stillness because it is a nerve. So it's relating to the lung energy. Um, and so you want to make sure that you remain very still. And then um, for the eyes, the, actually the saffron would be really helpful. And then making sure that if it's not related to glaucoma, making sure that you check to make sure that you don't have um, some glaucoma going on. Um, somebody asked me to explain in detail how nutmeg relates to the central channel. Mm -hmm. Um, so nutmeg is actually a little bit sweet. It's not so much astringent. Um, and that is really, it's sweet and it's hot and it's oily. So that's why, because the central channel is related to wind. And so that relates very much with the central channel. And so it helps sort of ground that through its heat and its oily nature. You do want to use some caution with nutmeg. If you use too much nutmeg in one time, it can become a hallucinatory um, situation. You'd have to take a lot. So, but I do like to um, sort of give that as a cautionary tale. Certainly putting a little bit in your, you know, non-caffeinated chai wind nightcap is not going to do that, but you just don't want to like go crazy with it. Sometimes Westerners think more is better. And it's, that's not always true. Great. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, anything to offer people that suffer from PTSD? Yes, um, several things. That's a win situation. So that is meaning that the nervous system has really been very deeply disturbed. And so the antidotes for wind would be warm, easy to digest foods, right? Minimal stimulation. So don't be doing fast mantras. Don't be doing a ton of really intensive visualizations, really doing like basic sitting meditation where you're seating and you're sitting with the breath, you're watching the panic and the thoughts arise and you're not going down the road with them, but you're just applying the object of support of your breath, bringing it back 
and really working with the breath so that you can transform the um, nervous system a little bit better and massage. Massage is the superior treatment for wind mm -hmm. and massage is easy to do on your own. Um, if you tend to have a little heavy indigestion, I do not necessarily recommend the sesame oil. It's a little heavy, um, either almond oil or apricot kernel oil might be a little bit better than the traditional sort of Tibetan sesame, which is very heavy. Um, and um, certainly if there's heat on board, sesame is not as advised. Don't be doing a bunch of coconut oil massage. That's very cold. So um, massage is actually really wonderful to do. There are certain points. So there's a point, um, we call it in Chinese medicine, we call it Rin 17. So I'm going to sit up here so you can see it. So you find the breasts, you go in, and there's a little divot. So at the base of your um, xiphoid process, you go up one divot and two divots right in between the breast. This is the Karnak song. So this is the meeting of the white and black channels. So if you know the Sauma, Roma, Kama, so the three branch channels. So this is a very powerful wind point. And it is actually forbidden in early acupuncture practice until you really know how to work with it. But even moxa, or you take nutmeg, caraway, and like maybe that piper longium, or I have a recipe um, on compresses that you can access and you make that and you make like a little cheesecloth, wrap it up and you place it on that point. You just warm it up in the microwave or the stove with a little bit of oil, or you can take essential oils and do that there. And the nutmeg, or you can just cut the nutmeg in half, warm it up and place it directly on there. Mm -hmm. So Perfect. that can be really, really, really quite good for um, PTSD, anxiety, wind, roaming mind, all of that. Perfect, thank you. We have a few questions in the chat too. Mm -hmm. um, so someone's asked, how do you use the bamboo pith? Like what's the best way to use it? It's a little bit tricky because um, it is a slightly challenging herb to get because it was over harvested. So you can actually just eat bamboo shoots. I know sometimes they're just in cans and it's not the greatest, but it's still good. Um, if you can get it and take it as a medicine, if you um, get the bamboo pith, you would just take it with your meals. Um, I would probably say to take it uh, between 11 and three. And also if lungs are something that you're trying to work with like post COVID, you take raisins and you soak them and you drink that water. Raisins are also very good for the lungs or you mix the bamboo pith with the cloves because remember cloves are very good for the lungs. I've had a lot of people that were on um, rescue inhalers that used clove and were able to get off the rescue inhaler and just use the clove and the bamboo pith. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, a technical question regarding the pronunciation of um, Pagan. Uh, pagan, yes. <laughs> pagan. So. Seems like a pagan, but pagan. Yeah. Right. If Rinpoche says it, it's going to be Wigan. <laughs> because okay. he's from Ando. So yeah. if you're from Ando, Wigan. <laughs> okay. If you're from Central Tibet, Pagan. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, um, someone has said they're very grateful and blessed to, to have the great teaching today. So thank you. Um, uh, one question they have is related to the five, um, hot springs, uh, mm -hmm. mentioned, um, coal, calcite, sulfur. Um, how do you know whether the hot springs have different kinds of minerals? Well, here where I live, they test them. And so we know exactly what they are. You can also know by the smell, um, mm -hmm. especially the sulfur. But yeah, you can just know, um, I think in ancient times they knew by the taste because ancient doctors were unbelievably amazing. And, you know, I'm like a very tiny doctor with very little knowledge. Um, the physicians that I trained with, you know, they can taste an herb and they can know like, oh, this, it was very dry this year. It's kind of like wine, right? It's very dry this year. And so I need to add more earth and water. So it's the same kind of thing. Their tongue was developed enough that they could tell. But 
I'm a modern sort of baby doctor and I just cheat and ask the hot springs what they have because they all tell you, they all know. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, someone else has asked any contradictions that you know of between Chinese and Tibetan medicine. Uh, for instance, the <laughs> simplest breakdown Tibetan medicine seems to have three things and the Chinese elements can come to be broken down into two. So is there anything else that sort of differentiates or contradicts? Yep. Um, so Chinese medicine only has five tastes. We have six. Okay. That's the main. Um, even though the elements break down differently, they relate very easily with one another, with time and practice of understanding them. Um, for example, like the wood energy of uh, the five elements very much relates to wind, right? And if you think about the nature of spring and wind rising and pushing up and coming up, it's all of that. Space really relates to metal, of course. It's often called ether in uh, Ayurveda. So there is some major differences in terms of some things we disagree about, like um, the potencies of certain foods and fishes and um, things like that, classifications of things. But you have to keep in mind and bear in mind, even when looking at classical Chinese medical texts, there's a very big difference between the north and the south of China in how they eat, what medicines they took. So the medical texts are very different. And likewise, in Tibet, we have the Jangpa tradition and the Zirka tradition. And so that means like central Tibet, eastern Tibet, very different climates. So, you know, um, they are very different in a lot of ways, but there is some things that cross over quite nicely. Um, if you're trying to decide to study one or the other, I say just study one, become really quite adept at it before you try to mingle too much. So like if you're a newly um, studied acupuncturist, really work in your field for a good five to 10 years before you begin to try and study Tibetan medicine, because you don't want to jumble it up in your mind. You want to really keep them as distinct systems. And it's also not appropriate to sort of mangle them together. That's how um, cultural appropriation gets lost. And because this system is really um, under threat um, and we have a responsibility to really present the lineage correctly, it's really important to kind of keep them separate. So when I'm teaching, I usually try and say, this is Chinese medicine, this is Ayurveda, this is Tibetan medicine. So it's not that you can't study them all, but it's important to to know um you know what what is what and where it comes from mm -hmm. perfect um we'll take a couple more questions we've got a couple more minutes left uh somebody has asked about these remedies for a canine so if um you wanted to incorporate nettles alfalfa and oat straw for a canine so to speak well, would mm -hmm. the dosage be the same no, because they're tinier bodies. So small canine, big canine, different. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you treat it like you would a child. So an average child dosage, meaning like under the age of five, it's usually um, one drop per five body pounds. Um, and then after age five, it's usually half of what a um, sort of like 12 year old would take. And a 12 year old is about half of what an adult would take. So if you're doing a decoction for yourself and you're drinking about a cup a day, that means a canine of a relatively decent size would have no more than a tablespoon. Uh -huh. Hopefully that was followable, but. Great, thank you. A uh, question about Ayurveda. Um, why do they perhaps, why do they recommend so much ghee? <laughs> because they're vegetarians. <laughs> and so they need the oil to ground their vata. Yeah. No, in all seriousness, really, that is why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I think um, that's where we'll finish up today. Um, Nishala, thank you so much for your um, 
presentation today. It was really wonderful and touched mm -hmm. on many, many elements um, and aspects for people from, um, you know, practices to um, practical applications um, as well. So thank you so much. Um, I know Rinpoche thanks you very much too. Um, and yes, to, to reach out to Dr. Nashala, um, please reach out to her website at holistic-health.org. Just as an aside, I'm about to go into a retreat, so I won't be around for the for next like you know ten days. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah, okay. And thank you, Rinpoche. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nashala. All right. Take care, everyone. <laughs>